Amen. Good morning. Hallelujah. Why don't we just, just open our eyes to Jesus, open our hearts to God. Amen. I believe God wants to do something in your life. He wants to deposit something in your life this morning. I've been sitting here and I was thinking, I'll introduce myself later, but I just want to say God knows where you're at. God knows what your need is. God knows your struggles. He has not abandoned you. He has not left you. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that He will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. And I want to encourage you with that and I pray that this word will minister to you this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we commit ourselves to you. We open our ears to you. We open our heart to you. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word, your eternal, powerful, sharper than double-edged sword. We pray that this word will speak to us, Lord. We ask you, minister to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be back. I was here in April this year and uh, May, and I walked into, I came to spend some time with my dad and, um, you know, my mom passed away four years ago, so we thought we'll do a Thanksgiving service with all my family, extended family. But then when I landed, that was the main reason why I was here, but when I landed, of course, all hell broke loose. You know, the church went through some difficult time. How many of you remember that? Yeah, it went through some difficult time. And, and um, so I got in, involved in that. And um, it's amazing to see what God can do when we trust Him. Amen. God is faithful. Amen. And when we trust Him, He will do what He is good at doing. Hallelujah. Cool. So the title of my message is, your obedience unlocks God's faithfulness. Amen. Our obedience unlocks God's faithfulness. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He was the same God yesterday. He's the same God today. And He will be the same God tomorrow. He never changes. Now we change. Our circumstances change. But He is forever constant and consistent. And so as we go through trials and struggles... God expects us to trust in Him and learn to keep our eyes on Him. Amen. And I believe as a church that we've been through this journey in April and May, you know, a lot of people go, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Did God leave us? What was going on? There are a lot of questions that arise, and I'm sure in your life you have a lot of questions too in your own personal circumstances. Now, God does what he does because he knows what he's doing. Amen. See, in, in a comfort zone, we like to be in a comfort zone and we, we're quite happy to be in a comfort zone. But God wants us to not just be in comfort zone, but he wants us to grow. He wants us to mature. Amen. Do you know the only way you grow is when you're going through pain? Amen. Nobody likes pain, but it is in pain you give birth. All the ladies said, amen. It is in pain. It is pain helps you grow. All the notes are on the uh, uh, U version. You can scan. You'll see the notes. I've got a lot of scriptures on it. But this morning, I want to talk about Ruth and um, how Ruth went through a similar experience that the church in, back in April and May went through. And Ruth was a non-Christian or a non-Jew. And do you know that the Bible, it's actually a book is written on the name of Ruth. And Ruth is the only non-Jew that's in the Bible. Everyone else, first Peter, no, Peter was a Gentile, but the others in the Old Testament, most of they're all Jews, but Ruth is the only non-Jew. And Ruth, I want to actually give you an overview. What I want you to understand is that when Ruth started a life, she was, she, the Bible introduces us to Ruth in, um, when her husband died. And uh, then Ruth goes through struggle and how Ru God was faithful to Ruth while her husband died, 
while she was going through the struggle and how God works out his grand master plan. That we don't understand why is this happening. Sometimes we can't comprehend it. But God, who is sovereign, who is all-knowing, amen? Now, He knows what He's doing with us. Now, God wants us to be faithful and God wants us to trust in Him so that He can work out His plans and purposes in our lives and through our lives. So I want to give you a quick overview on the book of Ruth. So there are four chapters on the book of Ruth. And uh, chapter one is a love resolve. Ruth resolves in her heart. That means she determines in her heart to follow her mother-in-law. And chapter two is about love's response. Ruth responds to Boaz and Boaz responds to Ruth. Chapter three is a love request. Ruth asks Boaz to marry her. And Boaz responds to that. And chapter 4 is love's reward. They get married. Isn't that cool? There's a happy ending. Hallelujah. Who's excited? You know, we all want to just enjoy the fruit. We all want success. We all want uh, prosperity. We all want what we want. But we don't like to go through the journey. Come on. Yeah? Yeah? You can talk to me. We all want the fruit, but we don't want to sow. We don't want to dig the ground, put the seed, cover the ground, uh, soil, water it, look after it, let the sun, the rain do its thing, and then wait for it to grow. It takes time to bear fruit. Amen. But you see, we all like the fruit, but God is interested in the journey as well. Hallelujah. He's interested in your journey. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that God knows the count of your hair on your head. Amen. Some people, it's easy to count the hair on their head because they got none. See, the book of Ruth starts, opens with a famine and, uh, and closes with a family. There were deaths in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is about providence. The book of Ruth is about conversion. The book of Ruth is about redemption. Hallelujah. Our God is our provider. Amen. Amen. Our God transforms us. Our God redeems us. Hallelujah. Are you excited? Yeah, we don't need our circumstances to excite us. We've got the living hope living in us. Amen. So heaven and earth may fa- fall away, but His word remains the same. Whatever may happen in your life, if you continue to rejoice and be faithful and obey God and trust God, you will see God unlock His faithfulness, His favor, and His promise in your life. Only when you look back and you go, oh my goodness, see what God has done. Hallelujah. Now, if you've known me back in the uh, late, uh, early 90s, you would have thought I had no future. You would have written me off, and uh, thank you for your lovely introduction there, Mr. or Pastor David Ebenezer. But yes, God did transform me, but I didn't look for transformation. I just looked to love God and serve God wherever He put me. I looked, I loved God, served God, trusted God, and in my day to day, the Lord led me where I am today. And it's not over yet. I know He has great plans for me, and I know He has great plans for you. And as we trust and follow God, and as we keep our eyes on God, not on what's happening and what's, what we're hearing the world is saying, but we keep trusting God, I know God will open the door for us to enter into our promised land that He's provided for you even before the foundations of the earth were laid. Amen. 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 Come on, somebody. You can talk to me. Amen. Yeah? You can talk to me. Because you see, if your marriage is struggling, trust God. There's only one amen. If your marriage is struggling, trust God. If your mother-in-law is torturing you, trust God. You say, why did you give it to me? Give it to them. But trust God. If your children are failing their exams, trust God. Hello? Don't call them losers because they ain't losers. They are children of God. 
If we trust in education, then education should give us a bright future. But I know a lot of friends of mine who are postgraduates who do, can't find a job. Trust Jesus Christ. If he opens a door, no man can. Come on. And if he shuts the door, no man. Come on. He is the almighty God. You and I don't serve a weak God. We serve a powerful God. We just got to trust, plug in with him. Hallelujah. Back to book of Ruth. You see, the whole of my first point, I want to give you my first point. And I'm sure for us Indians, we love this. My first point, if you're writing notes, it's full stomach, empty heart. <laughs> Pastor Roger is loving this. Full stomach, empty heart. I mean, I grew up here. I went to weddings. They eat like they've never eaten before. <laughs> Their plates are filled with mountains. And in a few minutes, it's valleys. And then they go back and get mountain. You know, we want to keep our stomach happy, stomach full, but we live with an empty heart. You may have all the degrees, you may have all the education, you may have the lovely car, lovely house, lovely wife, lovely watch, lovely children, lovely whatever, but you still live an empty heart life. Why? Peace doesn't come from education. Peace doesn't come by marrying a woman. There's actually less peace. No, no. <laughs> true, that is true too. You know, when I was a kid, uh, people used to come, my dad's sitting right there. People used to come to my dad and said, um, Uncle, you know, we need to get this guy married because uh, he's... Um, He's, you know, I'll use this word. We used to call it, he's joined the Air Force. When I say he's joined the Air Force, I'll say this in Telugu, okay? If you're Telugu people, you'll get it. He joined the Air Force. That means, So what they do is, uncle, we should get him married so he settles. Now you're taking your trouble, putting on another girl. You're causing double trouble. Marriage doesn't give you peace. Christ gives you peace. Amen. So you may have a full stomach. You eat lovely biryani, mountains of biryani. And we look mountain too. <laughs> oh, tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Anyway, Christmas season's coming. But you see, we've got to learn <laughs> to trust God. Hallelujah. Anyway, here we go. So the book of Ruth opens with famine. And um, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, in the days when the judges ruled the, is in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. Now you see, the book of Ruth opens with the time when the judges were ruling, and when the time when the judges were ruling, there was no king. Everyone did what was right in their own sight. There was no king. There was no order. There was no teacher. There was no law of God. There was no correction. There was no direction. There was no vision. There was no one to be accountable to. So they did whatever they want to do. Now, Ruth's, uh, sorry, uh, here we go. We see that there was a, a famine because um, the Israelites were walking in disobedience. It was a time of rebellion. It was a time of rejecting God. And they were living, it was a time of rationalism. Rationalism is about your, your knowledge, what you believe in, the truth, what you think is truth, morality. It's, a, it's in relation with culture. And they lived with humanism. Humanism is a rational outlook attached to human intellect than divine instruction. Amen. And then there was a relativism where people don't fall, didn't follow God nor his teachings. They just did whatever they wanted to do. But you see, there was this family, Elimelech, Naomi, and then there was Mahalon and Killian. Now, I want to give you their, their names. Can you put it on the screen if you can? That would be great. Elimelech, who was a man of God, who was a Jew, who lived in Bethlehem, the promised land, now wants to take his family into a place called Moab. 
El Elimelech means my God is king. There you go. It says it's my God is king. And Naomi means pleasant one. Naomi is supposed to be pleasant one, but she calls herself Mara, the bitter one. Isn't it interesting when we go through struggles, we start changing our profile. We start looking at ourselves in a different way. We start being critical on ourselves. We start pulling ourselves down. We start doubting. We start believing the lie than the truth. And then our spirit, which was joyful, becomes bitter. Where everything is negative. Amen. Even if people are celebrating, that hurts you because it's, you're not happy. So if you're grumpy, you want everyone else to be grumpy. But her name that God gave her was Naomi, a pleasant one. Isn't it funny in Bollywood movies, most of the villain's name is Peter. <laughs> Peter, come here. I said, why call him Peter? Why not just call him Venkatesh? Why is Peter a bad guy? You know, we name our children, oh, you know, Jacob, Joshua, Israel, uh, all the holy names, but they don't live like that. Amen. But you see, when you name those kids, you begin to speak what you believe in them. Amen. My name means rock, and I want to be a rock for God. Hallelujah. So, Naomi means pleasant one and bitter. Mahalon means weak or sickly. So in other words, she named him Sicko. Because he was a sick man. Sick boy. Imagine you calling your son, hey Sicko, come here. And the other son's name is failing, pining or crying. So she named him Crybaby. And Ruth means friend. Orpah means fawn and Boaz means strength. Why I'm sharing it, I'll explain. All right, verse 2. The man's name, Elimelech, and his wife, Naomi, they had two sons, Mahalon and Kilian. They were Ephraites, means people from fruitful place. People from a blessed place. Amen. Now, you and I are blessed people. Why do you think you're blessed? Because his hand is upon you. Amen. Not because you bought a new car. No, even though you drive a Bajaj Chetak, that's okay. Is it still a Luna? You know Luna? Chal mere Luna? You know? Even if you buy, drive a Luna, that's okay. But you're a blessed person because you got Christ in your heart. These people were blessed people. Amen. And then let's keep moving on. From Bethlehem in the land of Judah, and when they reached to Moab, now this is interesting, you need to understand, sometimes you've got to stop and really read it. They were in promised land, they were blessed people, now they go into Moab. Now there was a famine, there was a problem in Bethlehem, they packed their bags, because they didn't have a pastor, didn't have anybody, packed their bags, now they want to go to Moab, because there was more biryani there than in Bethlehem. Now, Moab means a land just short of the promised land. How many of us think about it's better over there and we leave the promise of God and enter into problems? Just because you see it's better over there. I want to tell you it's not better there there's problems there just as there's problems here. But the thing is, there's God here. There's protection here. There is provision here. You see, you've got to understand. So because Elimelech did not trust God, and he took his wife and two boys, and he goes to Moab, now he has a happy life for a few years, and then he dies. Then after a while, his, his two sons get married to Ruth and Orpah, and the boys die. Now, Sicko and Crybaby both die. Imagine this. It's like you've gone to America because it's better there. And when you get to America, you know you are the chairman and you are the chaprasi. Because I'm the chairman, I'm the chaprasi at home. 
I eat with style, I clean with style. I don't have servants. And I've got three kids, slave ministry. But then, it's difficult. You think, oh, if only I can go there, my friend. Let me tell you, problems are problems. Where there are people, there are problems. But we as believers have the promise of God, hallelujah, that we can navigate every problem with Christ in us who is the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Do you believe in that? And so here we go. So he leaves. And he takes his family and they die. Now my, Naomi's all twisted up and she's grumpy, she's twisted up, she's miserable. So what Naomi does is she starts pushing away her two uh, daughter-in-laws and she says, you get away, you get away and uh, go get married. And, and Orpah says, okay, bye-bye and Orpah leaves. Can I just say sometimes you just got to let people go that they want to go? They cause more problem being with you because they just whinge Nag, 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 nag. Nothing is ever right. Let them go. And that's why there's a great theme song. Let it go. Let it go. Let them go. Don't chase after them. If Orpah in your life needs to go, let it go. If the job is taking your peace in your life, let the job go. Come on. Let it go. Don't let your wife go. Don't let your husband go. Don't misquote me. A pastor said, let it go. See you later, husband. Get lost. No, 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 no. Let it go. But Naomi's Ruth, I love this in verse 15. Oh, let's go to Ruth, uh, verse 16. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Ruth could have stayed in Moab. Find another man, get married, be happy. But she says, please don't allow me to go. This is like a conversion. And she says here, wherever you go, I go with you. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people are my people and your God will be my God. Come on. A non-Christian is now saying, your God is my God. You know, Naomi, most of us, there's a lot in here, but Naomi is when you're hurting, you push people away. Go away, don't talk to me. When we're hurting, we reject people. I'm sure you all do that too. But you see, just because that you are being rejected, don't walk away, fight for them. Stay with them. Because they're not thinking right. And I'm glad Naomi said no, sorry, Ruth said no, I'm going wherever you go and your God is my God and your people are my people. So the two continued their journey. I'm telling you this story. Continued their journey, came to Bethlehem. And as they were coming, people said, hey, is that Naomi? Isn't that the pleasant one? And she says, don't call me the pleasant one because the Lord punished me and I am a bitter one. Why do we say God is punishing me when we willfully walk in disobedience? Why do we blame God when we don't trust God? There are a lot of people that are walking away from God because God hasn't answered your prayer. Come on, trust God. Even in the famine, trust God. Even in the valley, trust God. Amen. So Naomi says, I am bitter. She says in verse 21, she goes, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Full stomach, empty heart. Lot of biryani, but no peace. Lot of chicken 65, but no peace. No joy, no happiness, no fulfillment. I say it in my church often, I say, you buy a five, 10,000 rupees bed to sleep well, but you can't sleep well. The problem is not the bed, the problem is your heart. Amen. My second point is God uses natural events to effect a supernatural outcome. He always uses what, what you're going through to bring his sovereign plan. Amen. And so Ruth goes out and she's 
throwing these weeds. Now you can understand, I'm giving you the overview, but Ruth, who is non-Christian, remember that, she's a non-Christian, no Christ, no knowledge of God, no teaching of the Lord, can't understand God. She only met her mother-in-law, who is a believer, Christian, and the mother-in-law is worse, she's from hell. A bitter woman. And now Ruth says, I want to follow you. I will make your God my God, make your people your people, my people, your people, my people. And then she meets Boaz. I'm cutting the story short. And a Boaz happens to be Elimelech's relative. So she's picking grains and Boaz and her hit it off. They start talking and then she likes him. He likes her and, she, and he, she gives him, he gives her favor. And you see, and, um, and Boaz says in chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, ah, Yes, I know, Boaz replied. I know about everything about you've done to your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I've heard how you left your father and your mother, your own land, to live here among complete strangers. See, people will talk about you. You are known by your fruit. Amen. You're known by your fruit. What kind of fruit are we bearing? You can be in famine, yet you can be joyful. Do you know it's easy to love people who love you? It is a pain in the backside to love those who don't love you. They look at you like you're an insect. You know the look? I've had aunties who look at me like this. But the God's put them in your life so that He can teach you how to love difficult people. Amen. But look, listen to this. Number three, obedience requires for a godly outcome. Obedience is required for a godly outcome. Now in verse three of chapter three, now do, do as I tell you, the mother-in-law says, take a bath, put on your perfume, be uh, 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 and uh, look nice, put on a nice dress, and go and uh, lie before Boaz. That means get his attention. And now Ruth does that. It's like the mother is saying, Hey, don't go after him, go after him. And so she dresses up and she goes. Now, Ruth could have said, No, nah, I don't want to be. I've already married, I lost a husband, I don't want to marry an old man. Boaz was about 45, 50 years old, and Ruth was in her 20s. I don't want to marry an old man. She could have said no, but she said, mother-in-law, I will do what you ask of me. What I'm trying to say is God is faithful in the little things. You may not see it, but he is faithful. I say it in my church, a miracle is in the mundane. We want to look for the big miracle, but keep reading your word. Keep praying. The Bible says, keep on praying. Go to a connect group or a live group. Keep trusting the Lord. Bless somebody. Keep doing what God's called you to do. The miracle is in the mundane. If I want to live a healthy life, look good, have a six pack, not one pack, or a family pack, I have to exercise. The miracle, I, I don't get up one morning and go, whoa, I've got six pack like Spider-Man. Come on, we all want to be instantly fit. No, the miracle is in the mundane. Lord, I don't see a fruit, but I'm going to trust in you. Lord, I look at my son. He is an alcoholic. He's a smoker and everything else. But God, when I see the way you see him, I trust in you. So I prophesy life, future, hope, Christ in my son. Lord, when I look at my marriage, I speak life into it in the name of Jesus. Come on. Lord, I look at my business. I look at it and say, oh, my business is going down. The numbers are going down. Finances is going down. But I pray future in my business. The same thing with the church. Lord, there was a turmoil in the church. But I stand on your word. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of Christ. Amen. So now, this is what I want to say. And I want to finish this morning. Number four. Is rejection to redemption and legacy. And I want, you to, I want you to look on the screen. Is verse 18 of chapter 4. So I've given you four chapters in the last 28 minutes. This is the genealogical record of their ancestors. 
Look at this. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. And Jesus is the son of David. Do you see the grand scheme of God? He takes a non-Christian and when you read Matthew chapter 1, you will read the lineage, the, the lineage or the uh, geneolo genealogy of Jesus and all the way Ruth is mentioned in the genealogy. Why am I saying this as I close this morning? Where you are today is where God wants you to be. Where you are today is where God wants you to be. If you say, Arre, there was aircon, there's no aircon, God wants you to be. Oh, it's so hot, God wants you to be. My wife is annoying, God wants you to be. My husband doesn't give me attention, God wants you to be. My, my body's not being healed, God wants you to be there. My, there's no future for me, God is saying, trust me. Because in the, the miracle is in the mundane. Every morning you wake up with the promises of God. Every morning you wake up and say, God, I don't want to look at my problem. I don't want to deny it, but I don't want to focus on it. But I acknowledge it, but I put the word of God on top of my problem because your word is forever the same. Amen. And so I trust in your word. And so God, I stand there. See, when you are little by little, when you're faithful in those little things, you don't know what God is doing in your life. When I gave my heart to the Lord, the first thing they asked me to do was clean these dirty cables and clean toilets. I hated toilets, to clean toilets. And I said, why should I clean these toilets, God? How is that building the kingdom of God? But the Lord said, you cleaning the toilets is not building the kingdom, but you cleaning the toilets is the kingdom is building in you. Come on. Are you with me? I was faithful cleaning toilets. I was faithful in the scriptures that were given to me. I was faithful in the small things. I was faithful to go talk to my friend because I loved God and he was a rascal. So I said, hey, God loves you, man. And we became believers and believers and believers. There were about 17 of us who were believers. And now some of them are pastors. Some of them, now you see, that's what I'm trying to say. My great granddad was a Hindu, who gave his heart to the Lord, and his children, my grandparents were pastors, my parents were pa pastors' kids. Now, in my cousins and all of us, there are four of us that are pastors. You don't know what God can do in your life and through your life. Amen. You're not just born for the now, you're born for the future. So, what you do today, as Gladiator Mel Gibson says, and you know, not Mel Gibson, who is that? Russell Crowe. He says, what you do today will echo into eternity. What you're doing today, you don't know who you're talking to and you can change the destiny of their life because of your faithfulness. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So keep at it. Our obedience unlocks God's provision. Come on. Amen. Are you excited still? Yes. I wish I can with the click of a finger, solve your problems. But God is not genie. Allah then. No, He is your Father. Hallelujah. If you're in problems today, rejoice. Count it all joy when you fall in various trials and temptations because in due season you will reap a harvest. Hallelujah. You never know what God can do through your life. So whatever your problems, I know we're starting 21 day fasting prayer. And as we do that, as we prepare our hearts today, we're going to get those, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the banners here, and you've been given a post-it in your hand. And what I'd like you to do with that post-it is I want you to write three needs you have. 
three needs you have. Because you see, God knows your needs. Amen. But God wants you to ask Him. God wants you to ask Him. As we prepare our hearts, three needs. It could be healing. Now I want to say, I nearly lost my leg, but I believed in God. And today I am healed and I have my leg. It's not amputated. The doctor said, cut your leg out. I stood on the word of God. Today I am healed. I've got my leg. I don't have a prosthetic leg. Why? Because God is our healer. I pray that your faith will increase this morning. Maybe you've been seeing death. Maybe you've been seeing failure. Maybe you've been seeing all you saw is just nothing but unsuccessful. Trust the Lord. Hallelujah. Trust God. Hallelujah. Believe in God. Amen. Three needs. Write down those three needs. Prayerfully. Write down those three needs and put them there. Do you know God wants you to cry out to Him? Recently, I was saying and I heard too, it says, God is not moved by your need. He's moved by your faith. Amen. 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 So write your needs, believing in God. Three needs. And then three people that you believing for salvation in their lives. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. What we do by writing it up here is we are making ourselves accountable. We are saying, I'm writing it here. This is my faith vision. Amen. This is my faith vision. And I want to just quickly share. We had a pastor, not a pastor, a friend of mine. He came to one of our our pastor's uh, engagement party. I was born again and he was not. And he was was completely drunk and he came to church. Sorry, to this engagement party. I looked at him and I judged him. I said, no, my life is better. Look at him, he's alcoholic. And he was smoking like a chimney. One after the other. And he was fully drunk. And the Holy Spirit said to me, share the gospel with him. I told God, it won't work. And God said, share the gospel with him. I said to God, no, it won't work. I even said to God, I know you turned water into wine. But this guy drank whiskey. That's a different level. But the Lord said to me, share my love with him. And I did it out of reluctance like Jonah in the Bible. I said, Lord, I will prove it to you. He won't listen. And I reluctantly went to him and I shared the love of God half-hearted. The next day, he comes to one of our life groups just down the street here. And he stood there while we were worshiping God. And he stood there and he said to me after the meeting, he said, hey, what you were sharing with me last night, can you explain that? And so I explained to him, him and I and his cousin, we met at a cafe, not Starbucks, but Blue Point. Two by three tea and Usmania biscuit. They gave their hearts to God in that cafe. And today, one is a pastor serving Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Come on. The other one, he's done cross-cultural missions, bachelor's with Oral Robert University, and he actually fellowships in this church. You don't know what God can do, but God can do what he can do. You need to do what you can do, that is be obedient to God. Hallelujah. So as you write that, and then I want you to come and stick them here, please, and then I will come and pray. But you can write, just be careful as you come. And uh, take your time and just put them up here. And then we're going to believe for healing and salvation and transformation. Amen. And while you do that, the worship team is going to come and lead us into this song. Hallelujah. Let's go. Where I found home You were there
witnessed your faithfulness. I've seen you breathe life within. So I'll pour out my praise again. You're worthy, God. You're worthy of all of it. Your promises never fail. I've got stories I live to tell. So I. I just want to extend an invitation if there's someone here who doesn't know the Lord you don't know Jesus as a personal savior as a father as a friend you don't have a relationship with him and I want to give you an opportunity today as every eye closed every head bowed if you want to say yes I want Jesus in my life I want you to just slip your hand up so I can pray with you If you don't know Christ, you've never prayed a prayer to say, God, sorry of my sins. Cleanse me, wash me, purify me, make me your child. If that's your cry, I just want you to slip your hand up so I can pray with you. Is there anyone here this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. All right, why don't we now stretch forth a hand? Amen. Come on, why don't we stretch forth a hand on these names here? We sang that song, I've witnessed Christ's faithfulness 
Christ's love, he's constant, I've witnessed it. These might be just names to you, but these are the lives that Jesus died for. Amen. Amen. So God, we pray for salvation over these names. Come on, why don't you stretch for their hands. Father, we pray that addiction will be broken. Their eyes will be open to your truth, to your love. There is no sin that is greater than your love. Your love can penetrate any sin, darkness, and your light can shine in their hearts and in their lives. So as we pray the next 21 days for salvation, Lord, would you use us to share the gospel with them and that your love, your Holy Spirit will convict them. Also pray for the needs, Lord. There may be needs of financial needs, healing, relationship needs, job opportunities, future. I pray that you, Jehovah Jireh, God, you will meet these needs. Hallelujah. So we all agree together in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great week. And let's give the Lord a big hand. Amen. God bless you.